<laughs> no, by all means, you go, you go right ahead. Okay, if you remember, we started our deal in the last couple days with our look at uh, heat engines and uh, the NOS. We're not being very specific yet. Uh, right now, yeah, we're kind of keep them, keep, keeping them sort of cartoonish in that we just say that there's some high temperature reservoir from which, here we go, we're debuting the new chalk. Oh, awesome uh -huh. drunk straight. <laughs> <laughs> Got a squiggle to it. eBay. 75 pieces of this chalk on oh, eBay. Of that color. That color. Wow, just yes. 75 <laughs> pieces. I'm, I'm, I'm planning for you guys to be around for a while. It's a gamble without even trying it first. I got tenure. <laughs> <laughs> um, 75 pieces of tan and 75 pieces of carrot green. No, parrot green. Carrot sign green. <laughs> that, I misspoke. They are before you pick them. All right. Then we have this is this is what represents the heat engine. In fact, we might make a little symbol there uh, just to remind us that it operates in a cycle. That's actually an integral symbol with a circle around it, which is an integral done in uh, a cycle. Just uh, kind of like it. It's meant to picture. From that, we'll produce, hopefully, some kind of work. But as we were learning the other day, we're going to have to reject some amount of heat to some low, uh, low temperature, low temperature reservoir of some kind, uh, whatever, whatever that might be, whatever it might re represent. Now we started to look, uh, well what brought this on if you remember is we, we opened the, the class with that uh, business of planning on cooking a corn frittata and we successfully did so other than the fact we broke one of the fundamental rules of the universe to do so, which leads to indigestion. So we, we, had, to, we had to worry not just about satisfying the first law. That was very easy to do in a very unrealistic way. So we need some way to tell us the direction in which things can operate. And that idea then came to us uh, through the uh, what's called the second law. So far we don't have a specifically working definition for how it could show us that that opening example on Wednesday is impossible, other than our intuition says it is. Uh, but we needed something, uh, something to help us get an idea that it was indeed impossible. The closest we've got right now is what's called the clausius statement of the second law. Anybody remember which one that is? And it is one that related right to our, our little corn Fortata fiasco, which would be a good name for a movie. I would watch that movie. Corn Fortata? No, the yes. Corn Fortata fiasco. Oh yeah. Yeah, that is good. Or is that a band name? No. Band no, that's not. That's not. Why not? Where do these people come from? Fortata fiasco. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Uh, well, you could have the FFF or CFF. Uh, you Corn Fortata. <laughs> that wouldn't even be a good string band, bluegrass string band band name. Yeah, but it's, it's it's anyway, can we get back to the subject? Gosh, you know how much work we're going to get to? The week he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to fly through this material. He can, can never spontaneously go from a cold place to a hot place or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can get heat to go from a cold place to a warm place because that's exactly what our refrigerators do. But they can't do that without the input of some other kind of uh, effort or as we see some other kind of energy. Uh, so th the picture of it was we can't have some engine operating in a cycle such that all it does is move heat from a hot, uh, from a cold body 
up to a hot one without any other kind of uh, input to, to aid it along and, and to help it do so. And so that was that was as we as we know a violation. However, that doesn't really help us uh, address many things. I mean, our common sense told us that wouldn't work with the corn and the egg things on Wednesday. We didn't need Clausius to come to our rescue. We were already there with just the common sense that that wasn't going to work. So we're not quite at the point where we have a, an actual definition of the second law that we can use to say, okay, now I can see that that particular process or that particular cycle isn't going to work other than to say we got this kind of thing going for us. Then we also had another statement of it, known as the Kelvin Plunk statement. What's that one? Yeah, we we can't have an engine working in a cycle such that it takes heat from some high temperature source and converts that 100% into work. As we saw, uh, we do need in a real uh, operating cycle, we do need to have some rejection of some waste heat to the uh, to a low temperature heat sink. Uh, we can't have a 100% efficient um, cycle running. What? Oh, I thought that was a hand up. Okay. Uh, just to show you that those are equivalent statements, we'll imagine we have some high temperature source here, some low temperature source here, and we have two cycles running between them. One will be a, a good old standard heat engine cycle like that. So it's something that uh, causes us no trouble, no consternation in that it's doing what we need these type of things to do and is not in violation in any way of, of either of our statements of the second law. Uh, we may have to worry about the size of some of those numbers, but certainly this can do it. Uh, as possible. Now let's imagine running between that a heat engine of some kind that actually does violate the Clausius statement. We can do that because uh, it's just a cartoon drawing. We can do whatever we want. Santa Barbera told us that. Uh, with all their awesome cartoons. You can do just about anything you want. Like you can hit somebody on the head with a frying pan and their head takes that shape. I tried that on my son, it didn't work. <laughs> so, like a good uh, scientist, I tried it again. On yourself? Use a different pan. Do I look like... So, uh, <laughs> the, the first law of balance has got to be such that if a Q dot L is going up there, then Q dot L has to be going up there as well. Now, if we imagine these to be combined into but a single engine, which we can do since they're operating between the same two temperature reservoirs, well we've got in the low temperature reservoir Q dot L coming out and Q dot L coming in so there will be no heat transfer to or from the, the uh, lower heat um, reservoir. Our sort of twin engine thing there will be Producing some kind of work, 
and it will be accepting some kind of heat to do that, which I guess would be Q dot L, sorry, Q dot H minus Q dot L. But it doesn't matter what that is, because then what we've produced right there is a violation of the second law. Uh, sorry, the Kelvin Planck statement. So we have a violation of the Clausius statement that leads right to a violation of the Kelvin Planck statement. So even though they sound very, very different, they're uh, actually uh, equivalent you know, for our purposes and uh, show the very same thing. So we got to keep those in mind. There's several questions in the book asking uh, what's going on with these things and if indeed they do violate either one or both of those. And so we can be a little more specific now with our little model. I guess if I have 75 pieces of this chalk, I could give everybody one for you to do your note taking. So we have all these all these uh, energy transfers we have to draw. No, nope. evidently nobody wants one. I'll take one. Okay, 75 cents cost me 25. They're 33 cents each, and I got 75. <laughs> he, the guy had blue, but I would have had to buy something like 1,500 blue ones. And, and, uh, I don't have that much tenure. <laughs> so, uh, now, for our, uh, this is, remember, just our cartoonish purposes. This heat engine, though, uh, we, we took a quick little look at it. Not very specifically, we will much more detail coming up in that uh, it, it has a, a boiler at the top and that's where the heat is going in. Typically, that is from the combustion of uh, fuels. It could be though uh, through uh, nuclear reactions. Um, it's possible there are solar plants that have uh, enough, uh, enough area for enough solar input to actually get uh, uh, a sizable boiling uh, to go on. Then we run that high temperature, high energy steam through a turbine. Uh, it doesn't have to be steam, but that's what we'll typically look at. We run it back through a condenser where as it recondenses, it releases heat to some low temperature source. That typically being a, a lake or a stream or even just the atmosphere. And then once it's condensed back up to a liquid state, we pump it back up to the boiler and that's going to take a little bit of work to do that but much less work than if we left it as a vapor or a partial vapor uh, so it makes having the condenser very much worthwhile uh, we'll look at the specifics of what are the conditions uh, between each of those components, the, each of the four components, as we go into our power plant analysis in, uh, in a couple, well, I think we'll wait till Bill's gone, <laughs> because it's the most important part of the class, uh, and we'll make up the entire final exam. But, uh, that's what we represent when we're drawing just this simple little thing here that says there's a heat engine running in a cycle uh, in the middle. It's also defined at this time the thermal efficiency. 
the general generic definition of efficiency for our purposes for the thermal efficiency benefit over cost the ratio of what we want to get done by doing all this and what we're going to have to pay for to get it done and this is only in terms of the the uh, thermal quantities themselves there are other costs there's of course construction and design costs there are environmental costs uh, to this waste heat there are environmental costs to the byproducts of the combustion uh, but that's not part of a thermal analysis so the purpose of running these is to produce some net work that for our terms is the turbine work minus the little bit that we had to send back to the pumps uh, as we'll see with a simple steam turbine this uh, because of the fact that we're condensing the fluid and then pumping it as a liquid this can be uh, actually negligible in some cases if we need to do a real quick calculation we'll find that that can even be uh, neglected on the fly and then of course the cost we have to pay for is that high temperature heat transfer um, also remembering that from a heat balance uh, an energy balance on the plant as a whole that the network must be equal to the net heat transfer simply because there's nowhere else for energy to go to or come from just remember that this is true for a cycle it's not true for every individual process I predict three people here will try to apply that to a simple process, not to a cycle alone. So, Bill's one of them. Yeah. I'll take one. Yeah. Yep. I'll take this. <laughs> All right. So we can we can add that on to here uh, in that that Q net is Q dot H minus Q dot L then over Q dot H and we get a very simple relationship for the thermal efficiency of, uh, of a simple uh, power plant. Very simple one. We haven't even talked anything about, about what's, well we've talked individually, that's what we did last chapter, what individually what's going on in some of these components but we haven't specifically put that together as a power plant uh, analysis yet. Are you going to analyze the power plant we're going to? Uh, yeah, we will, but I don't think we'll do it until afterwards. We don't really look at uh, plant analysis until the, the week or two that's after that trip. But um, he's, he'll, he'll have he'll have a diagram, at least he did last time, he had a full plant diagram on the wall and it was recognizable by you as uh, as almost this. There's other things uh, of course involved in there but very few power plants are just four component plants. Um, but you'll be able to look at it and, and, and we can do some simple heat balances on, uh, on at least parts of it. Remember also that this heat engine can be run in reverse. Uh, I guess I have to turn my sign around. So it's running in reverse. Is that a reverse integral? I don't know. I, it is I, now. I, I, that would make it a derivative. All, all the times before I've talked, I, did, I never realized that maybe I should do that. Anyways, I, the reason for doing that is to pull heat in the other direction. Uh, 
In its simplest form, it can be just the power plant run in, uh, in reverse. However, we'll uh, instead uh, change a couple little parts to it. We can use pretty much the same diagram, just have things running the other way. Now uh, the fluid runs into the fat end of a backwards running turbine. What do you get then as a compressor? Um, and then there's a, a condenser up here. If you look at your refrigerator, you'll see, if you look in the back, well, what you'll see is, is uh, a whole bunch of stuff that you lost there a long time ago that rolled off the top of the refrigerator and fell down there and you can't go get it. And then when you do open it, you're going to guarantee to find at least one dead mouse because there always is. But on the back of the refrigerator, uh, some, ref excuse me, <laughs> some refrigerators have these actually underneath, but it's a long series of tubes and uh, uh, just a, it's a, a rather involved a heat exchanger. The tubes are just to greatly expand the heat transfer area to make that a little bit more efficient. Uh, that's the business going on here. If you don't clean those coils, what's so funny? You thinking about what's behind your refrigerator? Dana's? She's got, she's got Dana's just behind her refrigerator? I guess. I guess that's where has got it going. If you don't clean those coils periodically, then this heat transfer decreases and the whole system becomes a lot less efficient. Uh, oh, we have to run around that because that's in the way. Then uh, instead of running through a backwards running pump, which would be a turbine, we just run it through an expansion valve. And then it goes into a condenser. Uh, which is really nothing much more than a, than a boiler itself. Now if you remember the thermal efficiency didn't work there, so we define what's called the coefficient of performance, but we define it in the same way. Benefit over cost. Remember why it's not strictly a thermal efficiency, why we had to call that something else, even though the definition is exactly the same, why we call it COP instead of leaving it as thermal efficiency? It can be greater than one. Can be greater than one. Most likely is. Your, your home running refrigerator uh, most certainly is. But we can run this cycle for two different purposes so the benefit can change. We can run it to indeed cool what's already a cold space. So our benefit then would be QL. And the cost is the work going into the compressor. There's no other work. We don't produce work with this, though we theoretically could put a turbine there. Uh, it's just not right, worth having a, uh, a vapor turbine in your refrigerator, in your kitchen. It produces just a few, few watts. I call the box at the top. Is it, is it, is it huh? The, the this, oh, yeah, that's the back. Yeah. Um, actually, those are probably the other way around. Doesn't matter. We'll get to the details soon. The uh, other reason to run one is as a heat pump where the purpose then is the Q dot H over the W dot net that's costing to run that. I guess it wouldn't make any sense that's an evaporator because we're losing heat there, which is no different than what we're doing there. So good thing you're taking notes in chalk. See, if you look under your refrigerator, it's painted on the components right there in chalk. So the, the, they've already done this, that, that, will, that will ready to work. And then soar. 
I like how that spells. That's much more fun. Okay, so we've got we've got uh, we've got all those pieces that are running for us. All right, so that's that's uh, an important but kind of quick review to what we got to on Wednesday, leading to the, our next question, my next question, maybe yours, if you're thinking about it some, is that, uh, well, at um, least for the heat engine, since this is an awful lot of what uh, we, especially as a, a, a country, consumes huge amounts of power. What can we do to make all this even better? Not run it that way, run it this way. What can we do to increase the efficiency If we can, uh, if we could reduce the waste heat, wouldn't the efficiency go up? In fact, if we could get the waste heat to zero, the efficiency would hit 100 percent. But, but yeah, that violates uh, Kevin Plonk's statement of the second law. But it doesn't forbid us from asking the question: Well, how low can we get that waste heat? Or how much more of the heat that's input can we get to actually turn into work? And the, the step towards that is the introduction of what we call reversible processes. If each one of these processes at each of the four components could be reversible, it turns out that would be things as good as we can make them. But first we need to define a reversible process. Uh, well, as you can imagine, it's any process that we can run backwards. But that's not simple enough an explanation. That's the first part of it a process that can be run backwards, but such that everything returns to the original state. And by everything, by everything I mean both the system itself, including each component and the working fluid, but also the uh, surroundings as well. If either one of those don't return to its original state, then it's an irreversible process. Uh, You can guess what some of these irreversibilities are. Some of them are as, as obvious. Uh, friction, of course, being a gigantic uh, and very, very real irreversibility. So if we're going to try to make a, the maximum, most perfect, most efficient system we can, of course, we need to absolutely minimize friction as much as we can. That will allow us to lose less stuff, have less waste heat, those kind of things. Uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a goal, and a lot of design work is there, of course. Um, it can at least give us an idea of how well we could possibly do, and then we can compare how well we are doing to that as a benchmark. Another irreversibility is heat transfer 
if temperature difference between the two objects between theoretical limit, which means we're going to have to do some theoretical sleight of hand type of thing, uh, such as to say we're, we're doing heat transfer so slowly and so carefully and in so many little tiny steps that will add up to the whole process that the heat transfer is reversible at any point, even though in reality that can't possibly be the case. Um, other irreversibilities. Unrestrained expansion. You've seen how irreversible this is a million times yourself because everybody's seen what happens when a balloon pops. Baby starts crying because balloons pop. Dad tries to start explaining, but, but sweetie, that's an irreversible process. You don't understand. That's unrestrained expansion. I can't run and go make it run backwards. He says, but Daddy, what about the theoretical limit? You promised me. And then it's just, it's just, and before you know it, the kids have lost all confidence in you. <laughs> and they, what do they do? They go talk, talk to their mom who never even took college physics. Figure. Well, now know what's wrong with this country. Well, mostly my family. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. somewhere out there. <laughs> somewhere out there and a wife who didn't take college physics. Could their mother's name be Trudy? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, oh, you're recording. It right? could be. <laughs> Oops. It could be. She knows about Trudy. <laughs> <laughs> we, we share everything. All right, other, other things. Um, There are things, there are processes that are reversible or at least partially reversible if they don't happen spontaneously. But once it happens spontaneously, uh, like spontaneous mixing, or uh, I guess and or chemical reactions, if those happen spontaneously, meaning just the presence of those things together and they mix, if that's what we're talking about, is a mechanical process, or if they react chemically, 
just in the fact they've been brought together, uh, that that's uh, an irreversible process. Uh, what is it? Sodium that does that in air. Water does that in air? Sodium, sodium and water. Sodium water? Sodium does that in water. Salt water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, salt I get more help from I get more help from Alan than I get from you. <laughs> <laughs> so sodium water in air. Sodium in water. Yeah. Whatever. We've got some in the lab water. 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 No, I don't. I've seen it on TV it's scary. Uh, electric current. Through a resistor will be uh, irreversible. Most of you know what happens when you run current through a resistor. Be very, very hot. Well, little ones don't, but they do get warm. And you cannot then heat them up yourself, put heat into those, and have the current start running the other way. Uh, what other? Oh, two, two that have to do with uh, the, those of us that are doing strength of materials will recognize. One is uh, anything that's deformed inelastically remember part of why we uh, made sure that we stayed in the uh, that linear region on the uh, stress strain plot was so that if any time we could release the load go right back down uh, to where we had been before now that's not irreversible if you take into account the machine that was doing the loading but in terms of the piece itself that's that's an irreversible process we might call that an internally reversible process because the item itself is uh, returnable to its original place, but the uh, machine that did it isn't. And the other one is uh, hysteresis. Anybody know what that is? When you get your uterus out, right? <laughs> That's a hysterectomy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a good try. <laughs> Paul, you've taken a couple language-heavy classes, I understand. Yes. Wasn't he close? I have no idea what the removal of the uterus is called. It's <laughs> 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 so, so a hysterectomy. Yeah. So yes, Hysteresis is a, with an emotional reaction when you yeah. hear you have to have it. That's, 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 that's the name that's of the flapper album, isn't it? No. What? Like I know Hysteresis. that. Uh, <laughs> Does anybody on the adult side of the class know what hysteresis is? We've seen it in strength of materials as well. We had the uh, stress strain diagram. Remember, we went up the uh, linear portion, the elastic region, and, and uh, that was so we didn't get into inelastic deformation. But if we did go a little bit too far and it, we lost that linear region and started to curve over, I believe I told you what happens then if you release the load at that point. After you've gone in out of the elastic region into inelastic deformation, but then release the load, what happens? Yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't go back down the same line, it goes down a different line. That's the kind of thing that is hysteresis, when the, the two paths up and back are different. Uh, there, are, there are certain electrical processes that do it uh, in a repeatable way, but the two paths up and down aren't, uh, aren't, uh, aren't the same. And that's not a goose, that's a, a hysteresis. That's yeah. a, a goose that had a hysterectomy. <laughs> <laughs> a goosteresis. <laughs> now, with unelastic deformation, would it still be considered that if you had a metal can and you punched it in, and obviously you can't punch it out the same ever again, but if you take the can... Punch the can? You physically melt it and then reform it into the same shape. Is that count? Because you didn't do anything chemically, you just physically changed its state. 
to reform you, it, but melt it, recycling. Yeah, basically. Uh, is that still considered an inelastic? Well, uh, I I guess it could be. Um, it can't. It's not totally irreversible irre because, of course, the melting action when you reform the can, you don't get the heat back that you spent to melt it. But uh, we do have a, a two different levels of reversible processes. Uh, one being totally reversible, where both the, uh, the, the component in question, a can or a turbine or a heat cycle, returns, but so does the environment outside. Okay. We have internal reversible processes where, yeah, we can return the thing itself back to where it was, but we can't do that with the surroundings outside. I mean, that would be an example of that. Okay, so we get this idea of, of reversible processes in the same, and we start to uh, start to think about them a little bit. So let's do that and say, okay, imagine we have two processes, two two cycles, one irreversible and one reversible. One, a more realistic cycle like the type we have, and one, some ideal cycle. Who is to say that the thermal efficiency of the irreversible cycle really is less than the thermal efficiency of the reversible cycle? It's easy to make that statement, but um, only politicians make statements that are completely unfounded. Scientists and engineers don't. So, so we have to prove that that kind of thing is going to work. So what we're going to do is imagine then our two cycles, one irreversible, one reversible, running between the same two temperature sinks. So we'll have our irreversible cycle running there, taking in heat, producing work. We'll call that reversible, uh, sorry, that needs to be irreversible. We'll call this the irreversible net work Produced. I do like this chalk. It's pretty. Is it pretty back there? It's awful pretty up here. And so we have that. We have an irreversible cycle producing uh, what I'll call an irreversible amount of work. Just so I can keep those those two things straight, because they won't be the same unless they have the same efficiency because they're both drawing the same power, but we're not sure which one's producing more work. The one that produces more work will have the higher efficiency. And intuitively, you would think, yeah, the reversal one's going to be that, but what we're going to do is try to prove it. Actually, uh, those, two, those two couldn't be the same unless the work produced would be the same, and then we just know they're equal. So I'll put a, uh, maybe a prime on that one over there, uh, the uh, irreversible heat rejection. Okay, there's our picture. Now what we're going to do, we still don't know which one has the higher efficiency. So what we're going to do is leave the irreversible one alone, because we can't do anything with it anyway. It's irreversible. So we'll uh, leave it be q dot l. That's my q dot l prime. But 
this one, the one we're testing for whether it has a higher efficiency or not, we'll turn that one backwards because, well, by golly, it's reversible. Look, see? See how it's reversible? I, I guess, I don't know if it should be upside down or not instead. So it's irreversible, or it's reversible, so we'll run it backwards. Quantities are the same. We're just running it backwards. That's what we can do with reversible processes, reversible heat engines. Is that, can we, is it? Is this itself even any kind of a possible cycle? So, I mean, not the fact that it's an ideal one and we don't have ideal cycles. Is that even possible to just run a heat cycle backwards? Well, the work, you're adding work, sure. Yeah, which we are. Yeah, that's just a refrigerator. So we're running, we now have a reversible refrigerator running between the two, the same two heat, uh, 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 heat source and heat sink. And then if we combine these two, as we've done before, into a um, single engine, Let's see what we've got. So we've got some engine here running. It's receiving some amount of work, producing some amount of work. So we're not uh, real sure which direction it goes, but it doesn't matter. So this will be, oh, we can just call that net. That's the difference between the work we're putting in to run this one backwards and the word this one's producing running as a straight uh, power plant. These two, let's see, those also uh, will will operate. Uh, I mean, uh, partially negate each other. So that'd be QL minus QL prime. That's just combining these things into a single picture, and. Oh, these are the same. So we have heat transfer out of the source, heat transfer into the source of the same magnitude. That's a net of zero. That gives us a cycle working like this, which hopefully that gives you pause, which means therefore these this is a uh, violates Kelvin Planck because we're receiving heat from one source and turning it all into work. And what that means then is our assumption that the irreversible one was better than the reversible one leads to a, a fallacy. That's what had to do with the size, the direction of those things. So, uh, therefore we know that the, uh, the, indeed, the reversible efficiency is greater than the, uh, in the uh, irreversible. Okay, let's see. I think we'll have a little bit of time for a couple problems at the end just to help you on the, the set because some of them don't read quite uh, quite uh, as easily as you might think. In fact, that may be a good spot to go to some of the problems. It'll involve some of these. What we're going to do uh, then next is specifically address this idea of an irreversible, or sorry, a reversible ideal heat engine. 
Okay. Let's do this. Let's look at a couple problems, though, to, to start putting these words into uh, a little bit better. Uh oh. Somebody broke this thing down here. I may not be able to get that set. Oh, well, we'll see. If not, you'll have to pull out your books. I'm just doing this to give you some problems to look at uh, with your books. Look at that a little bit. Just start getting used to what these things are asking. This one's pretty straightforward, but not all of them are. So let's see if we uh, can address some of those. Uh, it just It's actually a, a sort of a matter of how they use the words they're talking about. This one's not so bad, but it'll get us warmed up. Uh, might be such that sometimes it helps with the drawing. This one's awful simple. Um, this, uh, in, in the way it's stated. When they say something like a 600 megawatt steam power plant, what you've been given there is the network. Actually, the network rate. Uh, which you know because of the units are watts on that. So that's about as hard as uh, that one will get, other than it asks the question, will the actual heat transfer rate be higher or lower than this value? Because you're supposed to find the heat transfer rate. When it asks for that, it's not talking uh, well, it says that the heat transfer rate to the river water. Now, the thermal efficiency, remember, is the benefit over the cost. The benefit, of course, is this work net that we're trying to produce. The cost is the heat transfer rate to run the boiler. Is that the heat transfer rate you were asked to find? Determine the rate of heat transfer to the river water. Or will they be the same anyway? This is the heat transfer rate to the boiler for which you're paying. That's the cost you have to pay for the fuel that supplies that. That is not the heat transfer rate you're looking for. What you're looking for is that Q dot L in this problem. Isn't that just 60% of 600 megawatts? Yeah, well, it does work. It, whatever the algebra gives you, that's all there is to that problem. You know this to be 40%. You know the 600 megawatts, so you can use that 40% to find this. Once you found that, then you can find that. Uh, you can also do it in that, uh, don't forget, for a cycle, right Bill? Work net equals Q net. Right Bill? Yeah. For, for a cycle. Cycle, Bill. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who else volunteered and screwed that one up, but uh, Bill did. Bill stepped right up there. Give me this tape. Bill, Bill's our go-to guy on this kind of thing. All right. So that one's pretty straightforward. Other than you have to come up with a little bit of understanding of what they mean by when they just say a so many megawatt uh, power plant. Um, Will the actual heat transfer rate be higher or lower than that? 
there's a certain amount of heat being supplied, certain amount of work being done, will the heat transfer rate be higher or lower than that? No, it's, it's, it's when, when you find this value, it's saying will it actually in real life be higher or lower than that? Well, once you, the, the last question, will the actual heat transfer be higher? When you actually find this number, which if it helps, I'll sell it to you. Uh, it's 900 megawatts. Will the actual heat transfer rate be higher or lower than that number? Was it the actual 600? No. The actual is the work produced. The 600 is the, the work produced. But that's not what this question asks. It asks about the heat transfer rate. So I suppose what makes this done? What's the actual heat transfer you're referring to? The heat, the whole entire it's thing? Or? This is like somewhat not a real world situation. And so it's saying if you put it in a real world situation, is it going to be higher? This, yeah, this is just simply based on the thermal energy transfer. Certainly, the thermal numbers, not taking into account any of the realities, the, oh, the real oh, numbers. So you say actual, yeah. realistic. Yeah. Okay. On uh, problem, let's see, I think it's 621. No, 622. 622, you have to think about a little bit too in terms of uh, what you're being told and what you're being asked to find because it's not in strictly the. the Q's and the W's that we're uh, normally talking about. But we can treat an automobile engine as if it's a power, uh, power cycle. And you're given enough there to find what the deal is. So the picture would be, we have an automobile engine that's receiving heat and turning it into work. And as we all know, there's some heat rejection uh, for automobile engines. The 55 kilowatts, take that to be the work net. The heat being transferred in, that comes from the burning of the fuel. So that's going to be, well, how would you find that? Get what's given. You're, you've got uh, fuel consumed at the rate of 22 liters per hour. And we need to figure out how much heat that delivers, the rate at which at which the heat is delivered to this engine that produces then 55 kilowatts because you're asked to find the thermal efficiency which uh, is the ratio of the benefit to that cost. So we have to find the rate at which heat is delivered by the fuel. We've got, we've got the 22 liters per hour, which is a volumetric flow rate. We've also got the density, which can turn the volumetric flow rate into a mass flow rate. And then you're told 
every kilogram of fuel, and you now know the rate at which those kilograms are flowing, you can multiply that by the, the heating value. If you take thermo 2, you'll do a lot with these heating value things, figuring out how much heat is available from, from uh, the burning of fuels. You'll even learn about the higher heating value and the lower heating value to make you more versatile, unless you're on vacation that day. So the biggest deal here now is, as you can imagine from looking at the number, watch your units on this problem. That's, a, that's about the only part to screw up, because when you've got that, then the thermal efficiency is the ratio of those two things. I guess it's not the net, it's the bit we're paying for from the fuel. So once you read, read through those words, uh, that one's pretty straightforward.
Okay, so uh, read through that one carefully. Look at the different parts you've got. You just need to do the two calculations separately for how much it costs total for each of the two kind of plants to be able to produce that much energy given how much it takes to construct it. Then you can use the 40% to figure out how much heat will be required to produce that much work. And then you can compare the two. And you'll get what's in Allen's head, 85 dollars per ton. So that is delivered? No, not delivered. Considering the price of oil delivered, that's pretty good. Yeah. Well that's part of our trouble. It's too cheap. So so we're more than happy to burn a whole bunch as long as everybody in West Virginia doesn't mind. And they don't seem to. Okay. Uh, some of the other problems, let's see, coming up after that, 43 is one of them. That's uh, uh, refrigerators, heat pumps, they're very similar to the other ones where instead of the efficiency you're given, the, uh, the COP, and you're to add, to ask to find the, the missing parts on each one. Uh, 43, oh, what happens to be at the turn of the page here. Well, you've just given a household refrigerator and its uh, work rate. So that's a pretty straightforward one to calculate. But some of the others are a little bit different, uh, like 46. 46 is a good one with the summer coming up because it has to do with cooling watermelons by large watermelons. <laughs> Now, this one, this one you, you might need to think about a little bit. Uh, a, a map or a picture won't really do. You've got a COP working as a refrigerator of 2.5. Remember, that's the ratio of the benefit to the cost, the benefit being the heat transfer um, from the uh, watermelons and divided by the work it's going to take to run the refrigerator itself, run the compressor. Now you're given the power input. Of course that's, uh, that's this piece here. What is it? 450 watts. You're given the COP. So you need to find, uh, that will then give you Q dot L. which is no trouble other than the fact that now you have to figure out how long is it going to take for you to cool five large watermelons doing it that way. Modeling them as water so you have that specific heat given there. So the picture for that would be something like uh, the heat is supposed to come from the watermelons and you can figure out the mass of those. Well, it's given 10 kilograms and there's five of them times the specific heat, and remember for liquids and solids, it's a, uh, the two specific heats are about the same, so we don't tend to put a, a uh, subscript on those. Then the temperature difference, which is given there, you're trying to change the watermelon from uh, room temperature 20 degrees to 8 degrees in the refrigerator. And you need to do that at a specific time. So given the COP, you can find the heat transfer rate from the watermelons. And then once you have that, everything else is given except the time rate, uh, the, the time it's going to take to do that. And in fact, then the answer is there. You should, shouldn't have a whole lot of trouble getting that. One question though I'll ask you is about the units on on the uh, specific heat. 
Were those, is that the usual units we were given? Yeah, we're usually in the, the numbers in the back of the book is not C there, it's Kelvin. So what's what why what's the what's the change? Why the difference? It doesn't matter. Because we're, we're using delta T. Delta T and centigrade and Kelvin are the same. Uh, be careful, uh, be careful, Bill, because we're gonna have some things coming up where it's absolutely crucial you know whether you're in Kelvin or uh, degrees Celsius or even uh, Rankine and uh, Fahrenheit. Okay, uh, the last one in this section I think that could give you a uh, considerable problem, just trying to, to decompress what the question asked is 53 here. Because you're actually given a little bit more information than you need and it can be difficult if you try to employ that uh, that little bit of extra information. In this one, you're you're told about an office room that has an adequate air conditioner. BTUs per hour is uh, no no. That's the English equivalent of kilowatts, and the conversion factor for the two is uh, right in the book because the rest of the problems in kilowatts. Well, part of it's, I guess, in BTU. This is fairly typical for uh, certainly American-made air conditioners to be rated as BTUs per hour. But then the room is converted by bringing in some uh, computer terminals that will produce a total of 8.4 kilowatts. There's a couple extra 7,000 BTU air conditioners uh, it is supposed to be BTUs per hour, but if you go talk to Earl at Ace Hardware, you can just say 7,000 BTU air conditioners, he'll know what you mean. Assuming a usage factor of 40%, that means 40% of this 8.4 kilowatts. So these things, these computers, terminals, printers, etc., aren't working at full, the full rate. They're only working at 40%. And then there's also seven people in there, each of them producing 100 watts. What you need to do is find out how many of these 7,000 BTU air conditioners you need to put in addition to the 12,000 that's there to take up this extra expected load. And what's a little confusing that might screw you up is you don't actually need that number of the 12,000. All you need to do is look at how much is the extra load, the 40% of the 8.4, kilowatts and the seven people and figure out how many uh, air conditioners will handle that. Now, uh, the 8.4 kilowatts is just the total rate of power. How much of that is work for the printer and the light and the computers and fans and all that other stuff? Well, that's kind of it. They're drawing 8.4 kilowatts, but the concern is uh, that only 40% is actually needed to be taken away as heat. So all you're concerned with is the 40% of the 8.4 kilowatts. We're also, we're saying that that 40% is actually going to be let off as heat? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, how'd the pink do? Pretty awesome. You like it? Great. Great. God bless eBay. All right, have a good weekend. You too. What? You gonna ride this weekend? Be nice.